Welcome to Startup Metrics Toronto with Max Kramer of Trialfire. Unfortunately, the first 60 seconds are cut off, so we missed his introduction, but the rest is here. Enjoy. And of course, they're perpetuated by, you know, publications like TechCrunch. Um, but the myths are that anyone can do it. You don't, you don't need money or anything like that. Uh, the old field of dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. And all you need is a good idea to get funded. So let's kind of break these down. Um, anyone can do it. Well, not really. You, you, you really need to have a thick skin. You need to, you need to kind of be the, a person that um, thrives on adversity. You, you got to be able to pick yourself up and dust yourself off when you fail. So um, it, it's not really for everyone. And the, the truth is, you, you do need some money. Um, you, you can't really do it all by yourself. I'm fortunate enough to have a partner for two ventures. And um, if you don't have a partner, well, you're going to want talented people to help you. And no matter how much they buy into your dream, it's, it's going to take money. And your marketing budget, your infrastructure budget, even though you don't need servers anymore, you can do everything in the cloud, those bills still keep coming. So myth number two, if you build it, they will come. Well, really they won't because they don't know who you are. Um, you probably don't know who they are or how to reach them. And if you built it without them, you're, you're probably off mark anyway. You've got to build whatever your offering is with the people that you're going to be offering it to. Um, you need a deep understanding of your market and audience before even setting out. And finally, my favorite, a good idea will get you funded. Well, a good idea might get you an introduction, might get your foot in the door, but ultimately you, you need to show execution. You need to show at least some traction, some form of traction. I know that um, you guys had the traction one of the authors, Justin, I think, right? For Justin Mears. Yeah. Right, Justin Mears was here. Was anyone here for that for that meetup? Well, yeah, you guys were. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll, t I'll touch on some of those traction points, um, but I guess the the main point is that, that those stories you read about in TechCrunch, they're compelling because people only write about those good stories. The guy that got funded with with just an idea, and and there's thousands of entrepreneurs that you know create a lifestyle business or have a successful exit and you don't hear about them because they're they're very run of the mill and there's there's really not that much compelling about them um, so how do we do it how do we how do we avoid getting caught up in the in the in the myths and the mythology um, and the answer is be a scientist uh, apply the scientific method that means do research, formulate a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, analyze data. Um, healthy skepticism it is really your best friend. It keeps your ego in check. It keeps your enthusiasm, which you need, but it keeps that in check as well. Um, so how do we start? What are the kinds of things that we're going to test and what are the kinds of things that we're going to measure? Um, I'm going to draw on my passion for, for motorcycles uh, to, to paint a racing analogy, so to speak. Um, so let's, let's equate your new venture or idea to training for a motorcycle race. So there's a lot of parallels there, if you think about it. Um, you can crash and lose it all. Uh, you can win the race and you get the glory and money that comes with that. You can come in third, but no one remembers who comes in third. Um, so in, in, in racing, there's, there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of things you can measure, like professional race teams. They have onboard computers on these bikes. They, they measure everything, like all kinds of telemetry data. Your, your cornering angle, your cornering speed, how much traction your tires are getting. Uh, the, the point at which you're switching gears. The point is there's a lot of variables. Um, but really, it all comes down to lap time. If I can consistently go around the track faster than the, than the next guy, then I win the race. So how do you find your 
metric of lap time. What's your what's the lap time for your business? Um, it's 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 really pretty simple. You 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 pick you pick the one thing that measures success or traction, and you work backwards. So if it's an app, it's downloads. If you're doing some kind of lead gen, you want to measure conversion. If it's a web app, maybe it's signups. I don't know. I don't know your business. So only you do. You got to you got to pick what that what that metric is. Once you've found it, what's next? Well, next you want to create a framework around that metric that's tightly coupled to your business. Um, a great template for building those frameworks is the. Have, has anyone heard of Dave McClure's Startup Metrics for Pirates? Yeah? Okay. So, um, pretty simple. I'll, I'll, I'll run through these really quick. Acquisition, that's your inbound traffic to your site, how much of it you're getting. So, you're, you're going to be able to, the lever that controls that is, you know, how much ad spend, uh, how, how much you're spending to drive that traffic. You got signups. So your, your, your visitors are converting to signups. Then if they're having you know, pleasant experiences, they're coming back, that's retention. Some people are gonna tweet about you, share, share your product idea app on Facebook, referrals, and ultimately you need to generate money. Maybe those signups become paid signups, maybe there's ad revenue, I don't know. Um, so that's a really good framework to work within. It's, it's really simple to understand and I highly recommend looking up the Dave McClure presentation. Um, it's, it's, it's become pretty much gospel in the startup world for just simple metrics. Uh, and it explains those five in, in much more detail than I have. Uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's kick it off. Let's start looking at some real world uh, cases of how metrics and data-driven decisions can be used for good. So let's start with GoToCall. So GoToCall was my um, first exposure to the startup world. I got recruited out of university by this company called Altel. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but it's a big US conglomerate. They do everything. Um, and I hated it. it. There's thousands of employees, and I moved out there, and it, I was just miserable. I quit within a month, and I went to I went to work for GoToCall. GoToCall was two guys with an idea in a basement, um, so it was pretty much a startup as you can get. And um, so let, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, this was around '99. This was the beginning of uh, voice over IP. So back then, voice over IP was getting hot. You can call people, call relatives around the world for a fraction of the price of long distance. Um, there was two kinds of voice over IP. So there was PC to phone and PC to PC. So PC to PC is like Skype. We take it for granted now that you can just call anyone on Skype and it's free. But back then, it cost money. It was still uh, maybe a tenth of what PC to phone cost. And the way it works is, when you call someone, the internet takes you part of the way there when you're calling a phone, but you need to have infrastructure on site uh, in, the, in the country that you're calling. So let's say you're calling um, China. You would need servers in the different regions to actually finish that last leg of the call. So there's a high infrastructure cost to getting into uh, the VoIP business and at that time there were there was a fair number of established players as well um, So go to call came into this space and They were an amazing success. I learned a lot from this story um, It's it's a great story because it's so brilliant in its simplicity. It's so easy to get so the way they started was not as a VoIP provider, but as a rate aggregator. So you had all these different companies and they would publish rates, their long distance rates, to different countries and we would scrape them and we would aggregate them and publish them on a go-to-call website. So right away you have your entire market, everyone who's using VoIP, going to the go-to-call website 
to figure out who's the best provider to use for calling you know my family overseas um, the, the the whole approach is is so very data driven it's almost evil how well it worked and understanding and capturing the users was built into their whole approach. They, they had traction even before launching their service. So now they have all these VoIP users coming to their site. Guess what? They launched their own VoIP platform. And it took off. Um, it, you know, even, even capturing, getting 10% of users to, to start using it was millions of users. So they were almost an overnight success. So that was fun. Um, then I moved back to uh, Toronto, and we can contrast go to call with the next uh, startup, which was Ocean Lake. So a little bit more background now. It's about 2002, 2003. It's the height of this dot com bubble. Um, it's also the emergence of smartphones. How many people remember like the original Blackberry with the little wheel on the side, it took AA batteries? Yeah. So they had r these really shitty browsers that they're not like browsers today. They, they were, they, you know, they were black and white screens, so they were just text. You couldn't even see pictures. Um, so I moved back to Toronto to join these guys, and Ocean Lake was like a textbook epic fail. Um, they focused, they first started focusing on payment processing and then they're like, wait, no, let, let's do mobile. And our first project was to build a wireless shopping cart. Um, and, and you know what? It, it did pretty well. You had, you had at that time this, this whole e-commerce boom. You had these e-commerce, uh, different, different stores web enabled phones were becoming more popular it's a logical next step to try and get people to buy stuff not just from sitting at their computer but from that mini computer they're holding in their hand all the time and we got some customers we had a, the, the the biggest name was the shopping channel and we sold them this wireless wireless shopping cart and it did really well people were using it they were they were purchasing products um, but then we decided to pivot. We decided to take this wireless idea, this transcoding of something that's normally on a PC or on a regular browser and applying it to any website. Um, so I don't know if, has anyone ever heard of WML? No? Yeah? Probably the reason you most of you haven't is because it's a dead language. So WML was like HTML but for mobile phones back in the day. Um, so we built this awesome platform that took any wired site, like any HTML site, and transcoded it so you can view it WML on a, on a, on a wireless phone, um, on a phone with a browser, I should say. And turns out nobody, nobody really wanted this thing. And obviously hindsight's 2020. you can look back and say, hey, well, that technology was obsolete pretty quick. Um, but they, they made a lot of other mistakes. I mean, they were the complete opposite of lean. Again, it was the bubble, so they, had, they were so cash rich. It, you know, we, we blew money on steak and scotch dinners. We had a corporate condo for some reason. It, it was ridiculous. Um, but in, instead of focusing on like, okay, why did they fail? Let's look at what, what could they have focused on what could have been their metric-driven approach that could have helped them long-term? So let's, let's look at that. Um, as I said, they had some traction. They had some early traction with this wireless shopping cart. And looking at the market size and the patterns that more and more of these phones are coming out that are web-enabled, um, you see a growing market there. So instead of investing in this wireless transcoding technology, um, they could have done some experiments. They could have asked people, hey, is this something you need? Uh, versus completely pivoting away from something that's working to something that ultimately didn't work. So after Ocean Lake went belly up uh, and the bubble had burst, uh, I started my next startup, uh, 
with my, uh, with my partner uh, who's with me still at Trial Fire, Mike. Um, so this was another, this was happily a, a, a great success, uh, as Borat says here. And uh, a little background. So the, the company was a uh, PLM provider. Does, does anyone, anyone heard of PLM? So PLM, it's, uh, the acronym is Product Lifecycle Management. You could think of it as a content management system for engineers. So it's, it's this platform where engineers collaborate. Uh, so you think about anything that's made, it has a bill of materials, it has design documents that go with it, has CAD drawings, all that data needs to be in one place so people can collaborate on it, revision it, add notes to it. Um, but the thing is, in the PLM space there was this huge vacuum because back then the PLM providers, people who sold software, this big enterprise software in the space, were IBM. Siemens and Dassault. And the only people who could afford their multi-million multi dollar deployments were companies like Boeing, Ford, Lockheed Martin, like huge manufacturers. But you have these big manufacturers with giant supply chains. You have all these little guys, the guy that makes hoses, the guy that makes circuit boards. Um, and guess what? Those guys are managing data like old school style in Excel spreadsheets, on share drives, information silos. There was no one really servicing their needs. Uh, so, so, that, so that's the space we got into. This was about 2004. So look, let's look at the, the data-driven approach. Um, what we built was, first of all, it was a, one, of the, one, of, one of the early software as a service applications. Now pretty much everything falls into that category. Rarely do you buy a piece of software, um, install it on bare metal servers, and, and run it that way. Now everything's hosted. Um, so we built this very generic platform, like a Webify database. And we gave it to a few customers. We gave them like a workflow engine, like a, like a field builder, so they could build out forms, uh, attach documents. It would automatically capture uh, an audit trail of what changed with their data. That was key for manufacturing because they have all these ISO certifications that they need to conform to. Um, and what they would do is they would use our tool to build line of business solutions. Like they would take something generic and point and click, put together something very specific to their needs. And what we would do is we would, we would generalize from that. We'd say, oh, these, these companies here, they're building stuff to manage their health and safety. And these companies are building stuff to manage their engineering change process. So what we did was we created a, a, like this feedback loop. So we'd roll out new features of improvements to workflow, things that customers suggested. We'd see how customers adopted them. And then we'd change our marketing to what they were building already. So you'd see customers were building like Health and safety, for example. Well, guess what? We'd use those keywords, we'd market, we'd sell into manufacturers that, were, that had that pain because they were, they were struggling. It took a lot of resources to manage all these certifications and all this data um, because they were doing it old school. So, uh, that, like, I, like I said, that was a pretty big success in, uh, as we started to acquire more and more customers. We, we started to register on the PLM radar as a provider. Other SaaS companies started popping up that started offering similar service. And uh, we got courted by a few different companies and eventually we were acquired by Autodesk in 2011. Um, one of the real problems that we never solved was the idea of free trials. So we would give, we would give manufacturing companies our customers. We would give them free trials uh, but we always struggled to understand who to focus on. So you have different, imagine you have 20 free trials going on. Who do you focus your sales efforts on? You want to focus on the companies that are most engaged with the tool. That are, they're the most likely to buy. So how do you determine that level of engagement? That was hard. And you figure that, okay, after you get bought by the software giant, everything becomes easy. Actually, that problem got magnified because now you're selling into all these different channels. You have so many free trials going on. You have a huge sales team, 
but who do they focus on? What are the best leads? So the next idea um, actually came out of that problem. Um, bu -bu -bu. So after two years at Autodesk, me and, me and my partner Mike, we decided, you know, the, the corporate life wasn't for us. We were going to quit and make another baby. And, uh, and we started Trial Fire. So uh, as I mentioned, the idea there was, was to solve the challenge of measuring engagement. Um, the analytics tools of today are very page view centric. You look at Google Analytics, everyone knows Google Analytics. Um, detailed understanding of what users are doing and how successful they are with your tool, it's really difficult to measure and requires a massive investment in resources. You've got to go into the application and you've got to code for that, basically. Um, so with, with Trial Fire, what we were offering was a point and click way to instrument your application to capture data. So you're getting more than just page views, you're getting, did someone click on this? Did someone go through this? Did someone see this particular thing in my, in my app? Um, and as I said, to do that before, you have to code for it. Okay, so we launched our service. Here's what we measured, traffic. That's a no-brainer. Sign-ups, another no-brainer. Engagement, well, that, that's the tricky one. So that's that engagement thing. And I'll, I'll get into more on that later. But let's look at our sort of data-driven approach to building out this company. So has anyone heard of Betalist and Early Bird? Yeah? Great, so those are great ways to understand if there's demand. So back a slide, I'm trying to take a picture of that, that correlation. This one? Yeah. Or this one? You're very kind. No, nope. well that's beautiful too. This one? No, no, forward. Forward? Yeah. The comics. The comics. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Done. So, there's these services that allow you to post, hey, I, I have this product or service, and you can see if there's demand for it. You don't even have to build it. You can just put up a landing page and see if you can drive traffic that way. If it resonates with people, you'll get some visits. Um, then we, what we did was we segmented those beta users that came in off those sources. We, we looked at them and we, we saw, okay, some of them are our dev shops, which makes sense because we're offering an analytics solution. Some of them are um, agencies, marketing digital agencies, and some of them were web apps like ours, uh, like Datastay was. Uh, some of them were just standard websites. Um, we had one customer, uh, one early adopter that was an amusement park in India, and they're just, they're huge. They, they, were responsible for like a third of our traffic at the beginning. But one thing to keep in mind is that early adopters aren't necessarily always representative, right? That's sort of my word of caution there because those, those people that visit those sites, they're part of this whole startup community. So just keep that in mind. So once we had all these different metrics in place, we built a funnel. So how many people here know what a funnel is? That's good. I'd be, I'd be worried if, if a lot of you didn't know what a funnel is. So our, our funnel looked like this. Um, this is an interesting case study that I'm going to show you about how we used our current data, what kind of experiments we, we ran, and how it actually changed the funnel. So signups, I'm not, I'm not even measuring visitors. I'm looking just at the people that sign up. They're, they're, they're my top funnel. You sign up, you get an email, it says click here to complete your registration process. Everyone's seen that, it's pretty standard. So that's activation. So you can see 5% just sign up and they don't get the email or they sign up with a bullshit email address. Okay, the next two I gotta explain. So tracking snippet. If anyone's ever used Google Analytics or similar things like that, they require you to take a little piece of JavaScript code and put it in your website. And you can see here that there's a big drop-off there. 
and there's an even further drop off to creating pins. So creating pins is, is a way of point and click instrumenting your UI with, with our tracking technology. I'm going to show you how that works in a sec so you get an idea. You know what, let's do that now actually. Ba -ba -bum. Okay, so here's our tool. Let's go to, well, let's, let's start a new one. Let's say you, you sign up, you get an experience similar to this, and you put in your website. Okay, well, my website is reddit.com. Now, obviously, Reddit's not a customer. So what used to happen is it would show you Reddit, and this thing would load, and it would show you this little piece of JavaScript that you got to put in. This is where a lot of people were dropping off. Because in order to use our tool and for me to demonstrate the power of it, I need you to put, I need you to take this leap of faith and put my code into your website. So here's what we did. We developed technology to proxy the site and automatically embed our code just for the purposes of allowing people to interact with our tool. So here's Reddit and here's what our tool does. So let's say I want to instrument this menu here. I can create a pin and say track this. I can track this article, etc. You get the idea. You create these pins, they're visual, you see them on your, on your site. Um, you can do more complex things like I have a username and password here. I can create a pin on that. I can capture the person's identity. So people can now see the power of the tool right away. The first experience completely changes. So guess what happened to our funnel? So instead of a drop off, right, from 38 to 17, let's say 40 to 20, which was half of, half of our users were dropping off, that changed completely. So now, by letting people create pins, they see, oh, I know what this tool does, this is awesome, I'm gonna put it in my website. So we were able to double our, our active users with that, with that little experiment. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to sum it all up. So finding metrics that matter, it's, it, it's not easy, but it, it, it really it just takes common sense. Like, be pragmatic about it. Measure the things that affect your business right now. Not three years from now, not down the road, but like what's affecting your business right now. Um, don't try and measure everything. Don't ca get caught up. There's a there's hundred different tools out there that'll give you heat maps and the time people are spending on the site and the clicks per visitor. Don't, don't get caught up in all that. Be careful. Build a simple framework as early as possible. And be micro before going macro. So what that means is know your audience intimately. You get a few beta users, call them up, talk to them. Um, have discussions with these people, see if they represent the market you're trying to address, and use those discussions to formulate a hypothesis. Okay, test that hypothesis. You need to do this before trying to scale and build a repeatable process. Um, if you go macro too soon, what's going to happen is you're going to just end up going back to the drawing board more and more often. I think the one exception to that rule is if you have an incredibly, like I mean a really, really good knowledge of the space. Like you live and breathe that space from all angles. Um, Avoid vanity metrics would be sort of the last piece of advice. Um, that's an example. Trial fire process, process is close to 3,000 events a second. Wow. But what does that mean? N nothing. Um, yeah. 
that's it. That pretty much sums it up. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to come. And uh, I guess I'll open the floor to discussion, any kind of questions that you may have. Did you ever have an experiment that produced a completely opposite, I guess, um, I guess produced completely opposite data than what you would have expected? And then, you know, what did you sort of do to, to kind of correct it or, or take action from that? I guess the one experiment, um, the one thing that comes to mind was at, at data state when we were building the, this PLM solution, one of our, one of our early adopters was uh, a builder, you know, land development, they built condos. And I didn't think that would be a repeatable play because typically that industry is very old school. They're like still running on fax machines, right? That's how they distribute work out to trades, right? To get the tile guy to come on site, you gotta call him. He's, he's not gonna answer his email, right? Um, but after, after running some experiments and, and reaching out, uh, it turns out that the offering uh, appealed to these companies. And uh, we actually got a fair, fair chunk of builders as part of our customers, yeah. For Verilist and early bird, you said you could actually identify some of the users who were actually coming from there. So do they give the, the data about, you know, who are those users or? Well, they'll give you as much data as you ask, right? If you have a huge, big sign-up form, they're not going to give you, no one's going to fill that out. But you can tell a lot from like domain names, you know, people maybe sign in with Gmail. But the good thing about TrialFire is you put you got to put in your site to test out our product on your site. So by looking at their sites, just one by one looking at it, that's sort of the, the micro before going macro stuff I was talking about. We could identify them who they are, right? We'd see a couple people try different sites, but their their email is some kind of development agency. So we we, we get an idea. We we have enough to go on to build a hypothesis and test that data further. Does that answer your question? Can you talk about the process um, in trial fire um, where you came up with the experiment to try the, um, not having them have to embed code on their site, but actually, um, yeah. Right, so yeah. it was, like how did we come up with the idea to do that? It was, it was sort of born out of necessity because I'm, I'm looking at this funnel and I'm saying, this sucks. You know, how, why are half the people dropping off? And, and it's kind of obvious why. Uh, we use our own technology, like we kind of eat our own dog food and we instrument our UI with our own technology so we can see what people are clicking on, where they're going, what are their, what are their behavioral patterns. And um, that helped a lot in that understanding. So we, we kind of used our own tool on ourselves and that, that, that helped us and that, that's what fueled that experiment, I guess. So thank you very much. Love the talk. Um, really clear. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting to see your path mm -hmm. going to Chicago and then going from one company to another. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when does the next baby come and are you expecting Autodesk or some other firm to come in and purchase you? Um, I, not yet. Uh, we're, we're still kind of early. I'm not a believer in building for the exit. I like the idea of building a practical business that has its own growth and momentum. I don't, I don't like to build something that, I'm gonna build this because this guy's gonna acquire me. So, we'll see. I mean, I'll, I'll keep doing this for sure. Keep, keep doing startups, it's fun. Yeah, it's, it, it can be a headache and it's challenging and some nights I can't sleep, but I think it's all worth it. How big is the footprint now? How many people are in the startup? Just four, just the four of us, yeah. So, the method you're showing to capture data mm -hmm. is very, very deliberate, where you're deliberately thinking in advance, here's, I mean, it's, it, it clearly is representing that you've defined your hypothesis and then you're coming up with how do I test this, and then you're mm -hmm. finding what data to capture to be able to look back afterwards and evaluate, mm -hmm. right? By choosing, you know, what am I pinning? And right, 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 right. Yep. Um, what do you think about this kind of balance between 
deliberately choosing what data you're capturing and then being able to ask questions of that data versus trying to just capture every event you possibly can mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. that after. Right, right. So that, that's a really good question. It's, it turns out that um, math and science wise, it's really difficult to pick out correlations and patterns when you don't know what you're looking for. It's not an easy science. But when you build a site, you, you build it deliberately. You have calls to action in that site. You have a buy now button. So to, to instrument that kind of stuff, to, to be able to pin an, um, an ad or an error message and understand how many people see that error or ad, uh, that makes more sense to me, I think. Do you think that as people move towards more semantic markup or meaningful markup, then you'll be able to move further away from deliberate pinning and towards just capture the thing. You know, I clicked on a username and I clicked on a mm. article name, whatever that. Maybe. Is. But you're not seeing people actually move. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one thing to have the markup be semantic. It's a whole other thing to have that semantic applicability to that particular line of business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of assuming that, like, as a creator of a site, I'll create whatever is semantic or meaningful to me. Right. Um, and then if you were to be able to tell me, you know, nobody is spending any time looking at the thing you call an article, but people are spending time going through the thing that you call whatever, uh, a widget, whatever right, right, right. name I've given to item A. That right. I mean, that, would, that information will be meaningful to me, even if it's not meaningful to you. Absolutely. I, right. Yeah, I, something like that could work, but how far away are we from that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had a question for a while. Yeah, uh, I'm curious as to, this will end up being a two-part question, as to what the revenue model is for trial fire and to what extent you believe price is part of the product and how you go about testing that. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, that's a really tough one. So. Our pricing model is fairly standard for analytics or really any kind of software as a service, and that's uh, traffic per month. And you, you can check our pricing page, right? So, uh, depending on how many visitors your website gets, uh, that's what we charge. So you you know you got starts at like twenty bucks, goes up to a thousand bucks a month. So that's the pricing model. So uh, the second part. How do you how do you adjust your pricing model to see like tall like market tolerance to the price? Is that it? Kind of. Yeah, probably. I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. <laughs> Did you, have you tried A/B testing your price, for example? Uh, we have not. No. Okay. We have not, but. It's worth it. Can't, that, that's the, you can't test everything at once, right? I only have like a certain amount of time in a day. So. But it, it, it's, that's a, it's a good idea. It's worth, worth it to do that. You can, um, you can use tools like Optimizely, which, which allow you to do A-B testing. And you can just, I can just double my prices for half the visitors. Well, is that, are, are, are they going to be as willing to pay? That's an awesome experience. I'm actually going to try that. It's a good idea. <laughs> so you, I think that was an amazing case study where you showed that you were able to double your conversions and talk to, to the bottom of the funnel. But this is not the very bottom, right? The next step would be them pulling out their credit card. Yeah, of course. So did you see the change in your conversion ratio, like at the last step? We don't see here? Well, all, ultimately, the you know it keeps it keeps going smaller. Unfortunately, that's how funnels work. But um, yeah, we got. We got more signups. We got more paying customers. Uh, was the coral was it was it double? I don't remember. Okay. I intentionally didn't took that out of this funnel. So yeah. Who are your competitors? We don't have any. <laughs> there's there's really no one that can do what we can do. Like it's I love your courage, but I'm just asking. Yeah, there's it, there's all kinds of like have you have you heard of segment.io? They have, yeah, so they have like one API that you can use to instrument your, your UI, um, and then you can send you the data 
to a bunch of tools to you know to to mix panel all these different analytics tools to Google we can do that too but you don't need to use an API so they're sort of the closest thing but they're very developer focused where I'm focused on the product manager I'm focused on the marketing guy whose job it is to to rule that site or that app no one can really do that so that's a good thing why not create these things that speak segment IO? Well, so we, we have a connector for segment IO. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I was looking at your the first page. Um, you start with the email address, then it goes to activation and the sign up. Uh, this one here? This, this funnel up on the screen now? Uh, no. It's just the first page of your website. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you come up with that? Like, why, why, why not just like the other guys show what you guys do and start from there? I just, I, I, just want to jump straight to create pins and then do sign up after that. Oh, we had that. We initially had like in the website. We initially had like you could put in any site and see the technology at work. And we decided to change that. What did you decide? What, what happened? Why, why, we, why we took out like the live demo? Uh, ultimately, I think it's, it's better to get people vested. You, got, you get a lot of tire kickers, right? A lot of people just end up at your site. Um, but the ones that sign up, click the activation, they're, 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 our product is simple enough that you can look at a five second video and understand what it does and that's what's on our website. Yeah. Was that a, was that a, dis, a deliberate experiment as well or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you charge per click or do you charge? Per, per unique visitor. Okay. Yeah. And does that, I guess, accelerate as you get to the final yes? So as this is funneling down, right? Right. Because I could have a million people uniquely visit my Rolls Royce site, but I'm not going to sell too many Rolls Royces. You see what I'm saying? No, no, no. So we let, let's say you're Rolls Royce, you're my customer, okay. right? So I'm going to charge you based on how many unique visitors you get as Rolls Royce on your website. That's how our pricing model works because for me to capture clicks and take all that data and send it to wherever you want to go, it costs me money. It costs me money at you know Amazon to, to process that data. I have to scale up my infrastructure relative to the traffic my customers are getting. Does that make sense? So you're looking for a unique customer when you funnel it down? I'm no. Saying, uh, there, a lot more people are willing to buy you know, a handbag that's going to be like whatever. No, this, this funnel represents trial fire customers. Like, so people who end up on our site and they sign up, they activate their account, and then they start using our tool. For whatever website, they're, you know, it, it might be an e-commerce site, it might, it might be Rolls Royce, it might be brochureware, it might be an app. And we charge, if, if you sign up, if, you, if, you're, if your free trial ends and you sign up, the price we charge you is you got to you got to pick a plan that matches the traffic you're getting. Okay. That's how our pricing model works. Would it make sense to use it just on select pages, or would it only work if I apply to the entire website? Yeah, you can use it wherever you want. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I use your tool to do market segmentation? Uh, in the sense that rather than starting off with a hypothesis about all my customers, which I do have, but I'm wondering, maybe I, I might be wrong. So, could I use it to test on the general population and see who actually end up using this my, my product? So, if you if you already have a way to segment your users, right, um, and you want to know the behavior of each segment, is that right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the idea. Yeah. So on your website you have uh, ad retargeting. Can you give some examples of how some of your customers use that service? Okay, uh, ad retargeting is a tricky one. So let me see if I can explain this. I'm a tech guy, so I just I write the code, not the marketing. Um, 
You see how complicated ad retargeting is, whether it's Google, it's Facebook. Okay, so ad retargeting, let me, let me see if I remember how, how this all works. So ad retargeting works by um, basically segmenting people, whether they've been there or not. Have, have, I, have I been to the Best Buy TV section, right? Have I, okay, I have, and then, and then it tries to retarget me when I'm somewhere else. Like, let's say I'm in Google, it shows me, shows me an ad that tries to get me back to Best Buy. So, the idea there is, what if you can segment even more specific? So, let's say I looked at cameras, but let's say you can see by my behavior, I'm poking around SLRs, I'm looking at lenses, you can paint a clearer picture for me. Right. And you could say, hey, this particular set of lenses is on sale now at Best Buy. So that makes the retargeting a little bit more effective. Does that make sense? So like Comwave, how would they use the retargeting? Who's Comwave? Comwave is one of your customers. I don't know if they're using retargeting. No, no, I don't know if they are, but I'm just saying if they wanted to. Because obviously you're wrapping a pixel, and that's the technical way that you're able to now track that person. So whenever they're on Facebook, for example, you can retarget your well, no, so we, the, the retargeting engine does that retargeting on Facebook, okay. right? We just send the data to that retargeting engine, so in there you can build your segments, right? Yeah. So, again, we're just an enabler, right? right? We, can, we can't do the retargeting, no, no, right? Obviously right, right, right. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Right. Cool. So, so uh, to build up on this question, you you would work with any retargeting platform, or you have hookups to? We have we have like specific connectors, yeah. So we we build we build these out, right? We okay. our first one was Google Analytics, obviously, and then not be like a one size fits all kind of thing. You have to build it out. Yeah, yeah. We build connectors to all these different providers, right? Some of them are like user engagement tools, like to Tango. Some of them are just straight up. You know, report builders, analytics, mix panel, kiss metrics, things like that. Any other questions? Hey. Sorry, my guy didn't do my homework, but um, how are you different from uh, Google Analytics beta version? The one that they actually take everything from thing on your website and say how many percentage of the visitors click. Okay, so, so you can, Google Analytics, um, there, there's a few players that, that do something similar. So you can render that data in like heat maps. So I think Crazy Egg is the company that does that. And you look at your website and you could, it, it, they actually paint a, um, an overlay on it. The same way we do an overlay with pins for, for actually collecting data. They do an overlay and they show you hotspots where people are going. Um, there are tools like um, heap analytics, but they're, they're an analytics tool. So they, they capture everything, literally every single click, but then you still have to be pretty technical on the back end to make sense of that. Because they don't give you a lot of information, right? They give you like the HTML attributes of that element, the classes that are on it. You still have to kind of be a developer to make sense of what it is they're clicking on. Mm -hmm. It would say how many people on every single page clicked, what was the percentage of people who clicked on this button, mm -hmm. on this button, on this button, mm -hmm. on this button. Mm -hmm. So this gives me this odd points where the most customers will go. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so we don't render th we don't render the analytics data. We just let you instrument your application. Right? We don't show you okay how many people clicked on. We actually had something that did that. We took it out. Because we don't want to be the reporting tool. We don't want to show you that data. We want you to use whatever reporting tool you want. You can use Google Analytics. Yeah, but, but what is your input to Google Analytics? Like, why would I need you? Right. Because as far as I understood from watching your trial fire website, mm -hmm. is that you can actually show me the behavior, not just how many of them clicked, but what was the exact path. Like, did they went? from here to here to here to here. Mm -hmm. That would be beneficial because that, that would show me how they read my page. Right. right? But, but now I'm 
Okay, so I, I think I understand your question. Let me try and answer it. So, with, with, with a tool like you're describing, I don't know too much about the beta version and I, I haven't seen what, what you're describing. Um, but with, with that tool, basically you get everything, right? Is that, is that what you're saying? You, get, you, you can see what everyone is clicking on. You can see every link, everything. No, no, I, I see a report, like a, not a report, but like my page, the percentage of the people who click on the particular buttons. So, do you specify those buttons or it just does all your buttons? It does all your buttons. And all your links? Or just buttons? Well, in my particular case, we don't have any links. Okay, right. But imagine a website that's huge. Imagine a web application. You have like links that expand certain tabs. You have links that navigate. You have, you, yeah, you're, you're going to get, you're going to get noise. You're going to get so much data. So that's fine. You got a lot of data. So now let me go back and go to my reports and slice up the data that I want. So our solution lets you do that slicing and deliberately picking your data points up front and visually makes it a lot more easier to cut through the noise and it allows you to do things like quickly test things um, quickly see are people clicking this versus that someone else had a question no all right if there's nothing else then uh, thanks everybody for your time for the discussion and uh, guess I'll give it back to Mike cool yeah